Awesome. No more morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> we are so glad to have this privilege to teach God's word this morning. As you can see, Pastor Josh is not with us this morning uh, or this afternoon. He traveled a little bit, but we will be with him next Sunday. Keep him in prayers as he's uh, going back to, to the family and the church very soon. But you should pray for him because of the situation of the pandemic, right? All the uh, quarantine and stuff like that. So we pray that he'll be on time and coming back to see the family. We miss him already, right? Yeah, so for those who do not know me, my name is Daniel Valume and I'm one of the servants in church. Uh, this morning, you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. I mean, sub chapter 7, I'm sorry. Matthew 7. Matthew 7, we will read from verse 24 to verse 29. Matthew 7. Let's read together. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and put them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he thought as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. We praise your name for such a privilege to hear your word, to learn your word. We ask that your spirit will guide us through as we desire to obey you, Father. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we all well know that this is the con concluding words that the Lord Jesus Christ is teaching uh, concerning the greatest, one of the greatest sermons uh, that has ever been preached. And this is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus Christ himself, our Lord, is taking a very good amount of time teaching his disciples on what the kingdom of God is. He is teaching them the kingdom principles. And then concluding, he just spoke those words that we just read. And uh, I don't have much time to go back to uh, chapter 5 where he started the Psalm on the Mount. But you know, we will just look into the immediate context in chapter 7. We can uh, look back into the connections that we have uh, on, on this uh, passage of scripture that we just read. You know, previously the Lord had given people few contrasts, and some of those contrasts we see is contrasting a narrow gate to the broad gate. He says that narrow, narrow is the way, uh, actually he says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And so there is this narrow way, a narrow gate, that is being constructed to uh, the broad way and the broad gate. And you find some things interesting on these two contrasts. Here he says that uh, this narrow gate, few people are finding it. And it's, it's leading to life. But, but the, the funny thing is that few people are finding this, that which is leading to life. Few people. And you see this 
other road, this other gate, this broad way, this broad gate that is leading to destruction, it is too popular. So many people are finding it. So many people are found in there. A very broad way and a very broad gate. They are going into the popular things. And, and he says that those who are following the narrow gate are the sheep, the true followers of Jesus Christ. But those who are going to the broad gate, the destructive way, are wolves. They are false prophets. And we all know, we all know for sure how this movement that are investing into entertaining messages, the messages that are not in line with the true foundation of our life, the Word of God, we know for sure how broad these ministries, these movements are. They are so large. They are so big. They are so popular. They are well known because they carry out the popular views. But only to lead people to destruction. And we see this other way that is too narrow. Few people are following after it. You see, Peter says in his letter that scoffers are making or are putting God's word into disrepute. They are inventing stories and fables. And they are making them famous. God's word is becoming less famous into pulpits. And we see there are contrasts here. He contrasts these two groups. He says that one is a good tree. And we see the good tree bears good fruits. That good tree bears good fruit because it does the will of the Father. That those who do the will of the Father. And we see this bad tree. The other tree is bad it's, and it bears bad fruits. Evil. It does evil things. It does iniquity. And that's why Jesus Christ said, be aware of false prophets. Be aware of false teachers. They come in, clo in the sheep clothing, but inwardly they are just ravaging wolves. They are coming to ravage. They are coming to destroy. They are coming to kill. As the mission of their father is to come and steal, kill, and destroy. The Lord says that be aware of those people. <laughs> it is irresponsibility if a Christian does not want to be aware of false teachers and false teachings. Because the Lord right there is giving us a responsibility to know these false teachers. These people who are coming to steal the joy. As you know, last week, Pastor Peter took us through Philippians chapter 3. And he talked about, in the beginning there, Paul saying that rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. And right after that, he says, be aware of dogs and pigs. <laughs> dogs and pigs. Why? Why should we be aware of dogs and pigs? We are rejoicing, but why should we be aware of these dogs and pigs? Because they are coming to steal the very reason of our rejoicing. They are teaching us something else. They want to build our lives on something that is not the true foundation. And he says, be aware of them. It is my responsibility and yours to be aware of these dogs and pigs. False teachers, false prophets. They, they know how to say the name of the Lord. They believe that we have one God. The Bible says in James that they do well because even demons... No, that's for sure, and they tremble. <laughs> they said that these false preachers, you know, they spend all their life and all their ministry casting out demons in the name of Jesus Christ. We cast out demons in the name of Jesus Christ. I prophesy to your life in the name of Jesus Christ. Miracle is happening. And you guys know this donation, don't you know it? Sounds like a pig, right? Like a dog. In the name of Jesus Christ. It's all those kind of things. We, we know them, right? We know them. But you see, they are spending all this time, all these calories, changing their voices, and only there to see that the Lord says that depart from me because I never knew you, you evildoers. 
What a sad thing. You spend all your life talking about Jesus Christ, saying to people that you believe in Jesus Christ, only for him to tell you, depart from me, you evildoer. I don't want to be there. and We don't want to wish that for us here. That's why we are going to learn the word of God and make sure we establish our life on true foundation, on the true rock of our salvation. The intention of the Lord is to make us aware of the things that will build our faith, on the things that will stabilize our lives. He's all-knowing. He's just and loving. He wants to give people an opportunity to choose what their lives should be. He is putting in front of us two ways. One is narrow, one is broad. One is leading to eternal life, one is leading to eternal destruction. And he wants us to choose. Why? Because you know in the beginning, Genesis, God created us for a loving relationship with him. And there can never be a loving relationship if there is no choice. That's why he had created the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So that man can choose either to to obey God or to obey his pleasures and feelings. Choice. God doesn't want us to be the robotic Christians who only come to church and say, I love you, Jesus, I love Jesus. Can you imagine your children, if you have children, I don't have some. The Lord will bless me with some, amen? Amen. (laughs) Imagine you have children and... You just tell them every morning, I want you to repeat, I love you, Dad, I love you, Dad, I love you, Dad. You'll be tired with that, right? Because you're forcing them, I love you, Dad, I love you, Dad, I love you, I love you, I love you, Dad. And they fall and say, oh, I love you, Dad, I love you. And you, you, you'll be bothered with that. But what if you didn't tell them anything, and surprisingly, you're coming from work, and you hear your children say, Daddy, you know what, I love you. Mommy, you know what, I love you. What would you feel about that? Awesome, right? I don't know how it is, but I will feel it one day. I want them to tell me, Daddy, I love you. You're just a great dad. I don't like that. But it won't be the same if they're just forced to say it. I love you. I care for you. I love you. I care. That would be funny, right? It would be tiresome. It would be bothering. And the Lord wants us to make choice. The choice between eternal way and destructive way. He wants us to make a choice. The Lord wants to establish a stable life for us. A life where no trouble, no hardship, no persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, or death of life, or angels, nor demons, neither present or the future, nor any power, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation shall separate us from his love. Paul said that in Romans chapter 8, verse 35 to 39. That's the kind of life the Lord wants us to have, a stable life. Even when you go through trouble, you go through hardship, you are stable. Nothing will ever separate you from his love. That's the kind of Christianity that the Lord is establishing to his disciples. That's the kind of life that the Lord wants us to have. But we need to make choice. We need to choose. That's the stability the Lord wants us to have. And so I'm going to spend the rest of my time here talking about the nature of this stability. The nature of stability. In verse 7 of the same chapter, uh, in chapter 7 verse 24, the Bible talks about, therefore, everyone who hears these words. Now, there's another contrast that the Lord is going to establish between... A house that is built upon the rock, good foundation versus bad foundation. And you see, see, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine, these sayings of mine. So we find that the first nature of true stability is that true stability is revealed through God's word. 
God's word is the revelator of what true stability is. Now, for you to understand stability, you have a responsibility to know God's word. Everyone who hears, it is up to us to hear the words of the Lord. We need to listen to the words of the Lord. You can't say that you know the Lord if you do not know his words. He wants us to know his words. He wants us to understand his words. Because from the word of God, we find the perspective of what stability is. And he wants us to have a stable life. But that stable life, you won't find it in the philosophical books. You will find it in the word of God. Because he is true. He is the one who reveals what is true. He is the one who reveals what stability is. So our lives have to be found on the word of God. The foundation of our life should be God's word. We need to hear God's word. We need to listen to it. And therefore, we will know what true stability is. Actually, in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, 47 to 48, he talks about the same, same parable, but he says that this wise man went up and dig. He was digging deeper to find the rock, to find where to start the foundation of the house. Digging deeper. We need to, get, to dig deeper into the Word of God. I thank God because the team of our church is growing deeper together. We need to go deeper into God's Word, hearing God's Word from the very heart of the, of the Lord himself. We need to know the Word of God. You find some movements are spending their time into training prayer warriors, right? Prayer warriors, which is a good thing to pray. But let me tell you one thing, a bird can never fly with only one wing, right? For us to have a balanced flying, you know, flight, we need to have both wings operating. We need to have the very understanding of God's word and a prayerful life. And we will fly properly. But if you, and I know so you find other people just spending time, you know, reading, reading, reading without a prayer life. We need both. They are both essential. We need a prayer life. We need also the word of God in our lives. Because from the very word of God, we learn what prayer is and how to pray. Actually, he even taught them how to pray. Secondly, the nature of Stability, the true stability is established through obeying God's word. True stability is established through obeying God's word. You know, the Israelites were aware this wasn't too strange for them. They were aware about the consequences of not obeying God's word. Actually, if you read with me from the book of Ezekiel, Chapter 33, starting from, chapter, uh, from verse 22, or oh, 31, I'm sorry. Ezekiel 33, you see what the Bible says. God is talking to Ezekiel and, and speaking to him how people are thinking of him. Ezekiel 33, let's read from verse 31. The Bible says, my people come to you. God is talking to Ezekiel. As they usually do, they have the, the habit to come to you. They usually come to you. And sit before you to listen to your words, but they do not put them into practice. With their mouth, they express devotion, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. Indeed, to them you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well, for they hear your words, but do not put them into practice. When all this come true, and it surely will, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. <laughs> These people are coming to him. Say, oh, let's come. They have the habits to come. Let's go and listen to the word of God. And they come, they listen to what he says, only to view him as a musician who has a beautiful voice and singing a pretty love song. And then they enjoy that music. They enjoy that melody. But when they go out, they do nothing concerning what they heard. Does it not look like the church today? <laughs> it looks like the church today. People come. Preachers are doing a very good job. Pastors are teaching the word of God. 
especially here. We, we love God's word. We want to teach God's word with, with all our breath. But some people here, they only view us as musicians, comedians, you know, playing jazz, <laughs> playing some nice love songs. And you're like, oh, that's nice. Oh, look at that preacher. He, he's doing well. Oh, that's fun. Oh, he has some charisma. That's beautiful. You see, God's word is not revealed for us to feel better about ourselves. God's word is not given to entertain us. God's word is given to transform us and to people who are obedient to the Lord. God's word has been given unto us so that we become holy unto the Lord. You remember the priestly garments. You see, they had on the tabernacle, you know, it was written holiness unto the Lord. Holiness unto the Lord. And the Bible tells us in the New Testament that we are the priests. When you go out there, do people see holiness unto the Lord? When they see your deeds, or they see a bunch of Christians who come to church, they feel nice about themselves, and they go out there not doing anything that the Word is saying. It's not a musical concert. It is a service unto God where we are learning the Word of God to only go there to apply it in our lives. So you won't have an established stability in your life if you do not put into practice the Word of the Lord. Amen? We need to put God's word into practice for us to have an established, stable life. Actually, if you go to the book of James, James, a pastor in Jerusalem, the Lord's brother, he knew about the affairs of the church. He knew about how people are so phony in the church. And he talks about something here, talking about obedience unto God's word. He, he talks about an it in this way in chapter 1 of James verse 22 starting from verse 22 to 25 he says do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves do what it say do what the word says verse 23 anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like but the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this not forgetting what he has heard but doing it he will be blessed in what he does God wants us to be blessed. God wants us to live a blessed life. God wants us to live a happy life. But this is subject unto our obedience to his word. We need to look unto the perfect law of God and do what it says. Continuing doing what it says. That's the life of a Christian. It will cost us. You see, these two people are building houses. This guy who is digging deeper for the better foundation, he, you know, his house wasn't really faster to be done. But this other guy is just quickly building on the sun because it's just fun. It's quick. I don't want to spend much of my time. I don't have much time to lose. Let me just put it. Put it. And when you see these houses finished, this one that has taken long to, to, to find a better foundation, both houses look outwardly very nice. They're so beautiful, they're so nice, better locations. But if you go inside there and see the foundation, you will know the difference. The Lord knows the heart of man. We come to church, all, the, all of us look very neat. We all, we all, we all are fine. We, we, we look nice. We know how to say hallelujah, bonus view, right? We all know that. We all know all the technical Christian terms. But if the Lord searches your heart, what will he find? Did you build your life on his word, or did you just come and enjoy the jazz, you know, and all that? Christ wants us to build a firm foundation unto himself. And if you read again from the book of James chapter 3, verse 13 to 18, the Bible talks about wisdom. He talks about this wise man, and, and he's talking about wisdom, what wisdom is. And so in uh, chapter 3 of James, verse 13, he says, Who is wise? And understanding among you, let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. 
But if you have a bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it is earthly and spiritual of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that, the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace, raise a harvest of righteousness. That's the life the Lord wants us to have. The life that produces good deeds that are coming from humility, obeying God's word, submitting our lives to his word. That's the life the Lord wants us to have. So many people come to church, you know, they convince themselves, oh man, I'm saved, I'm saved, hallelujah, praise the Lord, I'm saved. They, they have communion, they go, oh yes, I am saved, I'm good. See, Charles Spurgeon says, do not think of yourself saved from sin if you're still living in sin. Don't think of yourself that you're saved from sin while you're living in sin. <laughs> That's what we find in church. People coming say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. But when you go out there, what a kind of life we're living. Do people see somebody who has established his or her life onto the word of God? Although people see phony Christianity. That brings shame to the name of Jesus Christ. Christ wants us to have a stable life. And don't think that will come. The establishment of that won't come if you do not obey God's word. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that examine your heart. If you think you're standing, examine your heart. Look unto it lest you fail, lest you fall into sin, lest you fall away, you wander away. Examine your heart. What kind of life are you living? What a kind of foundation do you have? Examine yourself. Maybe you think I'm a Christian and your life is the very opposite of what Christianity is. The Lord wants you to break that and make, make a better foundation. Why? Because storms are coming. Winds are going to blow. Rains are coming. Streams are coming. When they are hitting your house, your life, Will they find that your life is unshakable? Or will they blow it down? And the Bible says that it's a great loss. A great loss. When this unwise guy has built a house upon the sand and you know, the winds are blowing on it, when it fails, it's, it produces a very, 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 very bad loss. Can you imagine you invest all your life into building only to build onto the wrong foundations. Your life, your rules. Your body, your choices. God wants us to rebuild again onto the foundation. The word of God. Lastly, talking about the nature of true stability. Christ's authority is the certainty of true stability. We are certain of the true stability in him because of his authority. The Bible says in chapter 7 of Matthew, uh, verse 29, he says, actually starting from verse 28, he says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he thought as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. <laughs> authority. Authority. As the worship team is coming up, you see, the Bible says that Jesus Christ had authority, not like they are teachers of the law. Their previous teachers of the law, you know what they were doing? They were quoting other rabbis. Rabbi so-and-so said this and this. Rabbi so-and-so said this and this concerning this matter. <laughs> but Jesus Christ wasn't doing that. You know what the law was doing? The law was saying... You've heard people saying this and that and that, but I say unto you, I say unto you, I am, I am the one talking to you. I am God giving you the true principles of life. 
the authority of Jesus Christ. The Bible calls him in Revelation that is the Amen. He's sure in what he says. If he's saying that there are storms coming, if he say that there are rains coming, that will blow onto this world. He knows what he's talking about. He knows that judgment is coming. And by the way, judgment is starting onto the house of God. It's dangerous, you know, people think that it's fun coming into God's house. But judgment will start with us. What is your life founded on to? Will determine if your life will stand when the winds and the storms blow. We are sure that our foundation is firm. If we believe in the word of God, that has authority. It is authoritative. He wasn't just courting people, he was courting himself. Actually, he said that I did not come to take away the law. I came to confirm it. I came to make sure that you know the very intention of the law. All the law was written just about Jesus Christ. What is your, the authority of your life? Where do you find authority from? Where do you find decisions making from? Christ is giving us a chance today. To make a better choice. Storms are coming. What if you die today? What will you say before the Father? Will you, say, will you, will you tell him that, Lord, I was faithful in giving my offerings? <laughs> I was faithful into, you know, shaking hands in the church. You see, all our good deeds are only filthy rags before God. If you die today and your life is not founded on Jesus Christ, you'll be blown into hell. Christ wants you to make a better choice. Christ doesn't want us to have phony Christianity. Christ wants real Christianity. Christ wants the very people who are Christ-like the followers of him. And that is a stable life. What will you gain if you lose your life because of the love of the world? They give you the whole world and you only to lose your life eternally into hell. The Bible talks about something in the book of Revelation. If you start reading the book of Revelation, you will find... In the beginning, that you know, the, the beginning chapters, the word of the Lord is emphasizing blessed are those who hear and read the words of this book of prophecy. You know, blessed, blessed are those who hear and read. But at the end in chapter 22, verse 7 of Revelation, the Bible says that blessed are those of everyone who keeps the words of this book of prophecy. Keeping is a key. A bunch of people everywhere in the world who, who are very good scholars of the world. They know. They know theology. They know everything concerning Jesus. And they, they know he was a very good rabbi, a convincing rabbi. The difference is they don't keep what he says. Keeping the word of God. That's what will make you, you'll make you sure knowing that my life is stable. Even if I die today, I know that my Savior lives. Even though we'll go through troubles, waves, and storms of life, we know that we are stable in Jesus Christ. When wars are everywhere in the world, we know that we have peace in Jesus Christ. We know that for sure, for sure. Peter says that make sure of your calling, of your election. Make sure where you stand. Make an examination today. Because God wants you to have a very stable life. A very stable Christian life. You know for sure, if I die today, I know where I'm going to. We saw in the pandemic, we are, we are seeing things. People are agreeing with the, 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 the funny governments of the world saying that we should close the house of prayers because we care for the people. 
And they, oh, where do you find your authority from? You find your authority in the politicians? They will disappoint you. If you find the authority from God's word, it tells us very well that we should not forsake the coming together of, uh, you know, the assembling together of believers. Why? So that we stir up everyone toward love and good deeds. When people say, oh, they don't care, they don't care. Calvary is a bunch of careless guys. We're not. We care for you because we want you to have a stable life. Even during pandemics, even during anything that can come to your life, you know for sure, I live and I am standing in Jesus Christ, the rock of my salvation. He is the anchor of your salvation. The Bible says again, set aside Christ as Lord into your life. That's what he wants us. That's the foundation he wants us to have. It will be foolishness not to have our lives built upon Jesus Christ. As we bow our heads, I'm going to send out that same, same privilege that the Lord has given unto us to send it to people. Maybe your life is not in Jesus Christ. You're building your life upon the sand. Winds are climbing. Storms are going to blow. What will your life be during that time? If you're that person and you want Christ to establish a, a very stable life for you, I want you to raise your hand. As we are closing our eyes, I want you to raise your hand and, and get this extension of the blessing of receiving Christ and have a firm foundation of your life. If that's you, you want to be born again. You want to set your life upon Christ. Raise your hand. We don't know what will happen. Maybe we can get out of this place and you die. Or I die. What will your life be? If that's you, you only say, Lord, I want to give you my life. I want to build my life upon you, Jesus. Just raise your hand and we're going to pray for you. Can I love you? Thank you. I see one hand there. Thank you, brother. Anybody else who wants to receive the Lord? You find that your life is not really built on the Word of God. It's the very opposite of what Scripture talks about concerning life. And you want to change that. Christ is extending that opportunity to you. Just raise your hand and receive Him. Don't be ashamed of Him before men. Because he will be ashamed of you before he, I mean, in the presence of his father. The Lord himself says that. So if that's you, you want to receive Christ. You want to give him your life. Just raise your hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's pray for our brother. Thank you, Jesus Christ, my Lord. Thank you for your word. Pray for my brother. Let's realize that he wants to give you his life. He wants to build his life upon you, Christ. I pray that you give him strength. I pray that you give him all the ability he needs through your spirit to walk according to your word, Father. And when we die and when we meet in heaven, we will meet as brothers and say, indeed, we thank you, Jesus, for salvation. When storms of life will come, he will stand firm in your truth. Give him strength, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You can still raise your hands so the people can see and give the hands to Jesus Christ for that. Thank you, brother. God bless you. God bless you. Let's all stand together as we sing this last song and we receive the offering today. Blessings.